Today we're going to have a look at criminal law. Very loosely speaking, lawyers and the law for that matter can be categorized into two classes, civil law and criminal law. Now what are the distinguishing features between civil law and criminal law is what I'm going to have a look at first. So if you look at one level, civil, and on the other hand, criminal. Some of the few fundamental differences between civil wrongs and criminal wrongs are these as follows. Firstly, civil wrongs are typically less serious, less grave as compared to criminal wrongs. Criminal wrongs are something which would shock the public conscience. So let's note down the distinguishing features. Less serious, less grave, less heinous. Criminal wrongs on the other hand, they shock the public conscience. So for example, if you hear a person having a contractual dispute where he says somebody owes me 5,000 rupees and he hasn't paid me back yet, you think that yes, there is a wrong and the remedy needs to be found for the same. But on the other hand, you hear of somebody who's committed a rape or a murder, then that's something which would shock you as compared to that 5,000 rupees dispute. So a rape or a murder would typically be a criminal wrong, whereas the contractual dispute would be a civil wrong. Other simple examples of civil disputes would be property disputes, matrimonial disputes, labor disputes, and the list goes on. Criminal wrongs on the other hand, we've already mentioned too, rape, murder, other things like theft, the coity, kidnapping, abduction, the ones which sound more serious. Another distinguishing feature between civil wrongs and criminal wrongs is that civil wrongs are typically against or between individuals. Whereas criminal wrongs are typically wrongs against society. Why do I say this? If I have a dispute with a particular person about some money which he owes me, then it's only a problem between me and him. The rest of society is not involved. You're not bothered. 15,000 other people living around me are not bothered. But compare it with another situation where let's say you hear about a murder or a rape in the neighborhood. While strictly speaking, you may think that it's only that person who's affected or that person's immediate family who's affected. But keep in mind that until and unless that murderer or the rapist is found and punished, he remains out in society and he remains as a threat to the rest of society. Today he's murdered person X. Tomorrow he might murder person Y, who might be you, who might be in your family. So therefore we say criminal wrongs are wrongs against society, where whole of society is concerned, it's a wrong against the public at large, whereas civil wrongs are wrongs against or between individuals. The rest of the public is not really concerned with or bothered about it. A husband and a wife having a matrimonial dispute. So long as it's not you who's having the matrimonial dispute, you're not bothered about it as such. Another distinguishing feature between civil wrongs and criminal wrongs is that the aspect of intention. In order to be found guilty of having committed a criminal wrong or a crime, it must be shown, it must be proved in court that the person committed that wrong, committed that crime intentionally. So far as civil wrongs are concerned, be it a matrimonial dispute, be it a labor dispute, intention is not relevant at all. It's irrelevant. There are a few exceptions to both the rules, but by and large, one can simply say that so far as civil wrongs are concerned, intention is irrelevant. And so far as crimes or criminal wrongs are concerned, intention is typically very, very relevant. We'll have a look at this in more detail later. A fourth distinguishing feature between civil wrongs and criminal wrongs is the end result. What happens at the end of a civil dispute? What happens when a person goes to court 
and whether a person is found guilty, right, wrong, etc. The end result typically in a civil case is, if the person is successful in court, is the other party is asked to pay him some compensation, more often than not, monetary compensation. So that's the end result. You file a case against somebody with the whole objective of getting some sort of compensation, mostly monetary, sometimes it could be not non-monetary as well. But so far as crimes are concerned, you're not really looking for compensation. You're not looking for money. Somebody has been murdered, his family members don't want money. Somebody has been raped, the last person, the last thing a person would want is compensation in money form. You would want the person to be punished. So the end result in a criminal case is always typically punishment. So let's make it another distinguishing feature. So far as the end results of civil cases are concerned, it's usually compensation being the end result or the remedy. And so far as crimes are concerned, the end result or the remedy, the ultimate remedy is punishment. The person must be sent to jail or some other type of punishment. Another distinguishing feature which has to be followed and appreciated between civil wrongs and criminal wrongs is the procedure to be followed. When there's a criminal wrong committed, a crime which is committed, typically the first step which has to be taken is for a person to lodge what we call a police complaint and the police registers what we call an FIR, a first information report. It's the very first time the police are getting some information about a crime having been committed. That's the first stage. The second stage which arises after the first information report is lodged, after the complaint is filed, is the police now have some knowledge, have been informed about a crime having been committed. So they now have to take steps to ascertain whether or not a crime was committed, who committed it, why was it committed, whether it was done intentionally, etc, etc. So in other words, the police need to investigate. So first comes the complaint, coupled with the FIR, then comes the investigation by the police. So let's say it's a murder case. The police are going to look for fingerprints. The police are going to find out if there were eyewitnesses. If there's a dead body involved and it's found the dead body, it might be sent for post-mortem. There are going to be forensic tests, etc., etc. Once the investigation is completed, then comes the stage of framing charges, filing a charge sheet. If the police have identified somebody who they think is guilty, all these steps are going to take place. Thereafter comes the filing of a case in court in a sessions court because it's a criminal case. Who files the case? Is it the person whose family has been affected who's going to file the case? No, it's the police or the state which is filed, going to file the case because as I told you earlier, it's a wrong against society. So the government has a duty to protect society. The police is part of the government in a sense. So therefore it is typically the police which will file the case. So it would be something like state of West Bengal versus somebody or state of Bihar versus somebody or Union of India versus somebody. And then ultimately the magistrate will decide whether the person needs to be punished or whether the person is innocent and is required to be acquitted. Compare that with a civil case. If there's a civil dispute between two parties, there's no requirement as such of going to a police or lodging a complaint or an FIR being drawn up or an investigation as such. Your immediate direct remedy is to go and file a case in court. So therefore, to focus, the procedures which are to be followed are once again very different between civil cases and criminal cases. Look at criminal law a little bit more in detail. In India, there are three laws which primarily deal with crimes. There are other laws also, but the three most important ones are the IPC, the CRPC, and the Indian Evidence Act. Let me tell you what the full forms are. So the IPC is the Indian Penal Code. All laws in India and in other countries also usually have a year mentioned at the end of it. That indicates the year in which that particular law came into force or was passed by parliament, etc, etc. So, so far as the IPC is concerned, you'll be interested to know that it was framed way back in 1860, almost 160 years ago, in 2020 today. 
So framed by the British, because we were under British rule at that point of time. But still, very much in force, very much in existence, and possibly the fulcrum of criminal law in India. Such a brilliant law was passed by the British for us Indians. So that's the Indian Penal Code. Then we have the CRPC, the full form being the Code of Civil Criminal Procedure. Nineteen seventy-three. There was a code of criminal procedure earlier as well, but that got repealed. The one which is currently in force is the CRPC of nineteen seventy-three, and lastly, the Indian Evidence Act of eighteen seventy-two. So again, a very ancient law, but very, very much in existence and very, very important as well. So these are the three main laws dealing with crimes in India. So far as the IPC is concerned, it deals with what we call the substantive law. Which means it tells us what the different types of crimes are and what the punishments are in case you're found guilty of having committed any of these crimes. So A, it tells you that cheating, forgery, rape, murder, etc., etc. are crimes. And then it goes on to tell you that in case you're found guilty of cheating or raping someone or murdering someone or kidnapping someone, etc., what is the punishment that can be awarded to you by the concerned court? So it's the substantive law. The CRPC, as the name suggests, it's the procedural law. It tells us what is the procedure to be followed once a crime has been committed going to the police, lodging a complaint, the police drawing up an FIR, a first information report, the police carrying out the investigation, people going to court and taking bail, anticipatory bail, charges being framed, charge sheet being filed, the case being filed, the trial taking place, etc., etc. All the procedural aspects that finds mention in the CRPC. And lastly, we have the Evidence Act, which tells us what is the type of evidence required, how much evidence is required, direct evidence, indirect evidence, circumstantial evidence, documentary evidence, in today's day and age, electronic evidence, all that is finds a good mention in the Indian Evidence Act of 1872. So far as crimes are concerned, it's important to know two fundamental rules which are there. The first rule in criminal law is that any person who is accused of having committed a crime is presumed to be innocent until proven guilty. That's the first fundamental rule. So in case you're ever accused of having committed a crime, your best defense is to simply raise your hand and say, not guilty. I have not committed a crime. It's not for you to prove that you've not committed a crime. It's for the other side, that is the prosecution, to prove that you have committed a crime. Once the prosecution finishes its case, if the court is satisfied that yes, some sort of a case has been made out against you, then you need to defend yourself. But at the onset, outrightly, you don't need to say that you're guilty. You just need to say you're innocent and let the burden of proof always lie on the prosecution. So that's the first fundamental rule. You're presumed to be innocent until proven guilty. The second fundamental rule which I want you to keep in mind is the standard of proof. It's a criminal case. It's a crime which you've been accused of having committed. The consequences, if you're found guilty, are severe and harsh. You could be sent to jail. Your personal liberty is taken away. It leaves a certain stigma also, which is going to be attached with you for the rest of your life. So therefore, the standard of proof needs to be high as compared to civil cases. So in criminal cases, we say that the standard of proof is that the case must be proved by the prosecution beyond reasonable doubt. In other words, the judge, the magistrate, before he finds you guilty, he must be absolutely sure that you are guilty. If he has even the slightest iota of doubt in his mind as to whether you're guilty or not, whether you're innocent or not, he has to hold that you're innocent 
and you must be acquitted. If on a scale of 10, nine things are going against you, but one thing is in your favor, on the basis of that one thing alone, you must be found to be innocent by the court. You must be acquitted. Civil cases, on the other hand, the standard of proof is not as high. In civil cases, we say the standard of proof is a balance of probabilities. The judge will have to weigh the two parties' cases and decide whose case is more likely to be true, whose case is likely more likely to be honest. It doesn't have to be a complete outweigh. Might be a 50-50, might be a 60-40, might be a 70-30. And the judge will have to rule in whoever's favor, he finds the scales tilting more. Today we're gonna to have a look at general exceptions or defenses in criminal law. This basically means that because of you, a crime has been committed, a criminal wrong has been committed on the face of it, but for some reason or the other, for some exceptional reason or for some defense or the other, you won't be given any punishment. You would be found not guilty by the court. The court will acquit you. So there are many such general exceptions and defenses. We're going to just have a look at a handful of them so as to give you an idea as to what these are all about. So let's look at it from first from the perspective of a child. Any child under the year's age of seven years will never be guilty of having committed any crime. So it's an absolute defense to anybody who's below seven years of age, even if a seven-year-old kills somebody or steals something or commits any other crime or criminal wrong, the court will never hold him guilty. All that needs to be demonstrated by him in court is that he was below seven years of age on the date when he committed that particular wrong. Had somebody else committed that wrong, an adult committed that wrong, then yes, he would be found guilty, he would be given some punishment, but because it's a child below the age of seven, it is no crime at all. So let's just note it down out here. Below seven years of age. Never guilty. Let's now have a look at what happens suppose you're above seven years of age. What's the next category? So we look at above seven or greater than or equal to seven years of age, but less than 12 years. So still a child, but not as small as a seven-year-old child, slightly older. So the law in this situation, the IPC, the Indian Penal Code says, that in case you're between the age of seven and 12 and you have committed, which appears to be on the face of it, a crime, you will be guilty only if it can be shown that you had reached a particular level of maturity where you could understand that what you were doing was wrong. If you're a child between the age of seven and 12 of an immature understanding and you can't understand or appreciate the nature of what you're doing and that what you're doing is wrong, then once again, it's a valid defense. You will not be guilty. Just to give you an example, let's say there's a nine-year-old child and he takes a gold necklace from some friend's house and comes back home and keeps it with his toys. Clearly, he is of immature understanding. He's kept it with his toys. He doesn't realize the value of it being a gold necklace. He thinks it's just another toy. But on the other hand, compare it with another nine-year-old child who goes to somebody's house takes a gold necklace, and then comes back and hides it under his bed. He clearly knows that what he's done is wrong, which is why he's hiding it. In other words, it means he's reached a level of maturity, he's attained a maturity to understand that what he did was wrong. So in this situation, the second situation, he won't have a valid defense, but in the first situation, the child, completely innocent, a valid defense. Let's take a look at another defense. Let's look at self-defense. We often call self-defense private defense as well. These are interchangeable terms. Self-defense is nothing but where if you are under threat, if you are under attack, that somebody is going to commit some particular wrong on you, then obviously you don't have to wait and have that crime committed on you. You obviously can defend yourself. 
So somebody is attacking you with a dagger, comes close towards you, you're naturally not going to wait for the dagger to be inserted inside your stomach. You're going to push him back or take another dagger out and stab him with it or something like that. In the process, let's say you pushed him back, this man who came to attack you with a dagger. You pushed him back and this attacker's head hits against the wall and he starts bleeding profusely and let's say he dies. You've caused somebody's death. But would you be guilty of murder? No. You can put up your hand and then say, look, I was merely defending myself. I did push him, he did die because I pushed him, but this act of pushing was done out of self-defense. I will therefore not be guilty of having committed a crime. Keep in mind a very important thing. While you do have a right to defend yourself, your defense or your reaction to the threat which is imposed upon you must be a proportionate reaction. Somebody comes to slap you and you take a knife and stab him in order to protect yourself, that's not done. Then your reaction is a disproportionate reaction. So two things in order to take the defense of self-defense. One is there must be an imminent threat to you. You're about to be attacked. You're in some danger. Something bad is going to happen to you. Therefore, you need to defend yourself. And secondly, your reaction in order to thwart that attack, in order to ward off that threat, must be a proportionate reaction. Let's have a look at one more defense. A very common defense, the defense of intoxication. Intoxication, as we all know, not being control of your senses by virtue of administration of some third party stuff like some drugs, some alcohol, etc., where you don't know what you're doing, you lose control over your mental faculties, you lose control over your mental senses, and in the process, if you commit a crime, then you can take the defense of intoxication. But keep in mind, it has to be proved by you in court that this intoxication which you're claiming was done either against your will or without your knowledge. If you voluntarily get intoxicated, then you cannot raise your hand and say, hey, look, I was intoxicated and therefore I can't be punished for a crime that I've committed. Only if the intoxication took place without your knowledge, you've gone to a party, you're having some apple juice, but somebody spiced it up with some alcohol, therefore you get intoxicated, thereafter you committed a crime, you won't be guilty of a crime then. Then you can take the defense of intoxication. Or you've gone to a party and somebody forcibly forces some alcohol down your throat, then it's intoxication against your will. Then you can take the defense. But if you go to a party, drink voluntary, drink five, six glasses of alcohol, and then you commit a crime, then you try to take the defense of intoxication, I'm sorry, the court is not going to allow such defense. You'll be punished in accordance with law, whatever punishment the IPC prescribes.